All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Completed Life Initiative panel discussion series. Uh, my name is Sarah kiskaden I'm the, the program director for the Completed Life Initiative. And today I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker, um, author Katie Englehart. Um, and she recently wrote a new book recently published by St. Martin's Press called The Inevitable uh, Dispatches on the Right to Die. Katie has been a documentary film correspondent and producer at NBC News, and she has made short documentaries from across the United States and abroad and recently appeared on the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, and MSNBC. The Inevitable is Katie's first book, and we're delighted to welcome you, Katie, to our program today. Uh, joining co Katie in conversation um, are two luminaries of bioethics, Dr. Timothy Quill and Peggy Batten, both of whom are members of our esteemed advisory board here at the Completed Life Initiative, um, and both of whom it's always an honor to introduce. Um, today, uh, throughout today's event, uh, we welcome your questions as always. Um, so please don't hesitate to put those in the chat or the Q&A box, um, and we'll get to those um, later on in the program. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, Hi, Katie. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I thought we could start off with um, you introducing a little bit about what got you in, in, um, intrigued with uh, writing about the right to die, what, you got, what got you started on this journey, um, and kicking us off with a little bit of a, a book excerpt reading today. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for the kind introduction and for hosting me today. I'm really delighted to be here and um, especially looking forward to Q&A with um, people who are obviously well versed in, in a lot of the issues I write about. Uh, I wish I had a more dramatic or <laughs> maybe meaningful story for how this all started. But um, but for me, research on this book started with an assignment. So I was living in London, England at the time, and uh, this was 2015. The British government was debating whether or not to pass an aid in dying law, um, very much like the laws that exist in various states. And I was assigned to cover the debate. And I found it interesting, but also in a way tired and predictable. You know, we had people on the one side arguing for patient autonomy. We had people on the other side talking about a slippery slope to the forced killing of, of vulnerable and elderly people. Um, and of course, all along, uh, you know, we had the knowledge that Katie, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm not sure if it's my audio or, but um, your your audio cut out for me, so uh, I'm not sure if Peggy and Tim are having the same issue. No, very faintly. I heard her break up also. Hi, Katie. Hi. What about now? Sorry to start off Perfect. with technical problems, but you can, hear me. you can hear me now. Yep. Yes. Great. Where did, where did you where did you lose me? When you were talking about um, how you came to um, have this assignment, and you were just about to say, I think that I got hooked on this issue while doing this assignment. Is that okay. what you were going to say? Well, I was going to say um, it was more that I realized the story I was looking into this parliamentary debate. I mean, it was important, but in a way, it was besides the point because there were people all around Britain and all around the world who were not really waiting for laws to pass, not waiting for their doctors to come around, but who were finding ways to, to organize themselves. Um, and this surprised me. I think in retrospect, it shouldn't have. Um, I'm very loath to make comparisons with abortion. However, I think one relevant comparison is uh, a group like the Jane Collective, we know that before Roe v. Wade, before abortion was legalized in the United States, there were groups that were offering safe abortion access. And I realized there were groups doing the same sort of thing in the end of life space. Um, I realized that the internet had 
really changed the game. People were able to connect with some quite formal groups that offer on the ground um, sort of uh, education and, um, and, and, and a kind of assistance and also less formal groups um, on the internet that educated people about lethal options and in some cases introduced them to people who could help them obtain those legal options. So uh, this is this this kind of progression in my thinking also plays out in the book. The book starts in California. I spent about a month with um, Dr. Lonnie Shavelson, who I think is probably here today and who I know spoke with the group last week, um, who at the time had really done more aid and dying uh, uh, deaths than anyone else in the country um, or, or nearly. And then I progressed through a number of different issues that are, aren't really talked about when we're talking about aid and dying laws. So I looked at advanced age and the idea of old age rational suicide. I looked at how chronic illness plays in with proposed laws. I looked at people who suffer from mental illness, but not specifically from physical illness. I look at dementia. And finally, I ask questions about whether there should be medical criteria for assisted death at all. Um, so that's kind of how we move through the book. I think if there's anything that really grabbed me at the beginning, it was a line I, I really kept hearing both from advocates and in different formulations from ordinary people who I met while researching. And the line was usually something like, I'd rather die like a dog. So I met so many people in my reporting. I, I can't tell you how many who um, who told me about euthanasia, um, the euthanasia of pets, pets they had um, loved. And many people described those deaths as acts of mercy, as acts of love. And they would ask me why human beings weren't afforded the same privilege at the end of their lives. And this is really striking, of course, especially in the United States context. The United States spends more per capita on healthcare than any other country in the world. And what people were asking for was a very simple veterinary solution. Um, so my book really tells the stories of individuals. I have six kind of star protagonists and they take us through a number of different issues. I'm not an advocate. I'm not a campaigner. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a politician. My goal was to really show the issues in all of their complexity. Um, I think that people want to talk about this. Everywhere I went, I found people pulling me aside and confessing the darkest secrets to me about, you know, uh, an aunt or uncle who'd hoarded cardiac medication or, um, you know, someone who'd uh, come to an arrangement with their doctor sort of on the sly to, to have death um, hastened at the end. Um, and in a way, I found that there's not a, a lot of honest conversation about assisted dying and aid in dying. And I think that um, that comes from both sides of the political debate. You know, of course, critics on the one hand are often hysterical and, um, you know, refuse to look at data that we have from places like Oregon. On the other hand, I found that advocates for aid in dying laws often oversimplified the way that these decisions are made. You know, and as a as a small example, I uh, I know advocacy groups are very loath to talk about the role that money might play in these decisions. I found money influenced a lot of the um, decisions people made around end of life. Of course, of course, money did. It influences everything in American healthcare. Right. So my goal is just to prevent present stories as as I saw them. In some cases, I spent months and years following a, a single individual. And um, those are collected here. So I thought the easiest thing would be to read from a couple of chapters, depending on how long um, everyone's patience lasts. But um, I could dive right in with the start of chapter two. Uh, for anyone who has the book, it's page 61. And we're being introduced to a character named, a character, a person <laughs> named Avril Henry um, in England. And uh, this is the start of the chapter, so we're just meeting her. In the late morning, on the day she planned to die, in April 2016, Avril Henry went to get the poison from the downstairs bathroom. She walked past the mustard yellow curtains and the frosted glass doors of the parlor 
past the padded rocking chair where she sometimes sat for hours with her feet tilted above her head to ease the swelling in her ankles, she said. When she arrived inside, she steadied herself against the countertop before reaching up to the top shelf and feeling around for the glass bottles that she had hidden there behind the toilet cleaner and the baby powder. Two of the bottles were small, like jars of cough syrup, and had Spanish writing on their labels. They contained the drugs. Uh, the, a third bottle held orange liqueur. Avril's suicide manual warns that pentobarbital had a bitter aftertaste and recommended chasing it with a bit of spirit. I got it imported illegally, Avril had said of the drug supply. It's quite easy to do, but very risky. She was at her home in Brantford Speak, a small village in Southwest England with 300 residents, a pub called the Lazy Toad, a Church of English parish church, and a town council on which Avril had served several terms earning a reputation as brilliant and steadfast, if sometimes needlessly querulous. In her 80s, Avril had a loose, unformed aesthetic, all soft beige sweaters, soft beige skin, plastic clogs, walking aids, often dangling silver earrings, sometimes a dash of lipstick. By the time she planned to die, her white hair was so long that it nearly reached her waist. Things got stuck in it, some fluff, a twig from the garden, in the mornings, it took no small effort for Avril to pull the hair back from her face and impose a kind of order on it with hair elastics and bobby pins. By late morning, wisps of it would have escaped their restraints and fallen down around her forehead. Avril climbed upstairs slowly, as she always did, bent over and clinging to the banister, nearly crawling so that if she fell, she wouldn't fall far. Her walker was waiting at the top of the staircase, but she didn't need it. She was only going as far as the bathroom. It had always been Avril's intention to die in the bathtub, reclining and fully clothed. For weeks she had worried that in the throes of dying, her bowels would give way and she would make a mess of herself, and then that the house would smell for weeks. By dying in the bathtub, she hoped to contain the mess. Just in case, she left a bottle of Dettol cleaning fluid under the towel rack for whoever came to mop up after her. She explained all this in the suicide note. I'm about to take my own life, the letter read. I'm alone. The decision is wholly mine. This has been laboriously planned. When everything was ready, Avril called her internet provider to explain that even though she planned to kill herself at 7 p.m., she wished for her account to remain active until the executors of her estate had time to tie up loose ends around the house. Her longtime lawyer, William Mitchellmore, would later agree that this was a reckless thing to do, all things considered. But by then, Avril had already told her friends, her handyman, her caregiver, her gardener and his wife, and her acquaintances from the local swimming pool. She had read in some online forums that it was best to tell people about your death plans in advance. That way, they would be less traumatized by your suicide. Also, they would understand that you hadn't acted rashly on a very bad day. Rather, you had really meant to die and wanted to be dead. When Avril told her lawyer he wasn't entirely surprised, knowing Avril's personality as well as he did. Her dignity was fully compromised by the disease which attacked her nervous system, he told me later, as if dignity was a thing that could be broken by a body. Most people, Avril said, had taken the news well, though a few had not. One friend, a former colleague at the university, had even argued with her. Have you considered the effect of this on your family, he asked. Of course I have bloody well considered the effect, Avril said. Then she told him about all her aches and pains and untreatable conditions, about her flagrantly incontinent bowels. He was appalled, she said later, delighted, and I'm glad he was. Her handyman, Jeff, who had observed in recent years that Avril was spending less time in the garden than she used to, found the whole conversation a bit surreal, but told Avril over a cup of tea that he did not, on principle, object to her decision. I have no moral qualms about it at all, he said. Still, he asked whether the pain was that bad, whether this all wasn't a bit drastic. Avril brushed him aside. She said her suicide confessions were serious and final. They were not pretexts for sympathy and they were not invitations for anyone to try to stop her. Skipping ahead a little bit. People think it's easy to hang yourself, Avril went on. It can take over three minutes to die. And if you just happen to partially break your neck, you will end up a paraplegic. Killing yourself, especially if you were disabled, is very difficult. Very, very difficult. Indeed, I made a list of all the ways I could kill myself at home. Every method had its particular shortcomings. If she jumped from a roof, she might survive the fall. If she unscrewed the panel covering her house's electricity source and touched the wires, she could end up being roasted alive. 
For a little while, Avril had thought seriously about eating some of the lethal fungi growing in her garden. On the upside, there was no known antidote. On the downside, death by mushroom could be slow, messy, painful. The Nembutal would work better. Avril, online, Avril had read about a concept called the completed life. That's when you feel your life is shaped and finished and the direction thereafter is down. I did have a complete life. It was a great life. Um, so this um, chapter ends up following Avril through a very dramatic turn of events that involve um, British police in Oxfordshire busting down her door at the dead of night and um, with, with allegedly some tip off from Interpol that she'd obtained illegal drugs from Mexico. So it's quite an exciting <laughs> chapter, which I hope y'all y'all read um, if you have the book. And then I thought I'd read, if we have time, a small bit from near the end of the book. Um, in this part of the book, I'm in the Netherlands and I'm with a man named Dr. Philip Nitschke, who some of you might know as the founder and leader of a group called Exit International. Dr. Nitschke actually lost his medical license in the course of my reporting for holding what he calls DIY death seminars and teaching people how to end their lives and then sort of escaped to the Netherlands where he now lives on a houseboat. And we're having a conversation about a change in his philosophy over the several years that I got to know him. Philip thought the right to die movement was speeding towards a historic shift that would not and could not and definitely should not turn back from, a pivot from a medical model of assisted dying to a rights-based model. I'll explain the difference, he said. The medical model is where we see this as a service that you provide the sick. If a person gets sick enough and all the doctors agree, the person who is very sick and keen to die gets lawful help to die. The laws are quite complex because they have to decide whether you're sick enough. Now the rights model, which I'm strongly in favor of, says that this has got nothing to do with sickness. The idea is having a peaceful death is a human right. And as a right, it's not something that you have to ask permission for. In other words, it's something you have simply because you're a person of this planet. The rights model, of course, means that doctors don't necessarily have to be involved. The more Philip thought about it, the more he believed that the medical profession was in way over its head. Doctors had made themselves judge and jury in a process that had more to do with the human spirit than the human body, more to do with meaning and the search of it than physical pain. And what did doctors know about the meaning of life anyway? Doctors love it. They can't help themselves, Philip said. And I find that insufferable paternalism of the medical profession difficult to deal with. Lawmakers had played their part too. They had let it happen. Now, Philip thought, doctors and legislators were running a mutually beneficial racket each delegating decision-making and gatekeeping powers to the others so that together they could make, maintain control over death and dying because they were afraid of the alternative. Only a doctrine of rational suicide, a philosophy that accepted peaceful death as a human right, would correct the injustice. Embraced by the masses, rational suicide would be a slap in the face to doctors who claimed to advocate for patient autonomy but still clung to its ill-defined limits. It would expose old religious ways of thinking and exercise them from hospitals. Not even Kevorkian had thought so boldly, Philip said. Until the end, Kevorkian had insisted that doctors be involved, that doctors be in charge, that doctors know best. After leaving Philip's houseboat, I took the train across the Netherlands and spoke with Dutch doctors and lawyers and legislators. I wanted to understand what it meant for this tiny European country to be at the euthanasia vanguard, by the time of my visit, some people outside the Netherlands were already looking at the country with alarm. International newspapers like the Daily Mail ran headlines about Dutch doctors who granted euthanasia requests from patients with anorexia, personality disorders, severe tinnitus, feelings of being meaningless, and trauma resulting from sexual abuse. They quoted experts who pointed out, correctly, that the percentage of approved euthanasia requests was rising and that some doctors granted approvals to patients they didn't know very well, and that more than 99% of assisted deaths were judged by authorities after the fact to have been carried out correctly. In the Netherlands, wrote the psychiatrist and philosopher Scott Kim, the doctor is virtually always right when it comes to euthanasia. In his 2014 book, Being Mortal, the physician and writer Atul Bawande noted that historically, 
the Netherlands was quick to embrace euthanasia, but relatively slow to provide high quality palliative care. As such, Gawande wrote, the Dutch may have reinforced beliefs that reducing suffering and improving lives through other means is not feasible when one becomes debilitated or seriously ill, and in doing so, led sick patients to assume that they could find relief from pain only in death. Gawande referred to the country's high euthanasia rate as a measure of failure and said he was less worried about the abuse of these powers than I am about dependence on them. What if euthanasia became the new Dutch normal? In reviewing Gawande's book in the, New in the New York Review of Books, Dr. Marcia Engel, a former editor at the New England Journal of Medicine, criticized the author for failing to clarify just what about euthanasia he found so morally wanting. Why, she asked, is, does Gawande simply assert that one in 35 assisted deaths in the Netherlands are too many? Given the prevalence of terrible deaths from cancer, as Gawande describes so well in his book, why is it not the right number? When I was in Amsterdam, some doctors mentioned an ethics professor named Theo Bohr at the Protestant Theological University, who had served for 10 years on the country's euthanasia oversight committee before resigning in protest. I wrote to Bohr and asked if we could speak. My concern is that euthanasia is increasingly becoming the way to die for cancer patients, he told me later in stilted English. So gradually there has taken place a paradigm shift from euthanasia as a last resort to euthanasia as the preferred option. Many patients were asking for death without even seriously considering palliative care, which he said had improved significantly in Dutch hospitals since the 1900s. So what, I asked. I think there is nothing wrong with a good taboo, Bohr said carefully. Without it, we will end up in a society where elderly people are killed. You may say, is there anything wrong with that? Well then, in that case, your question already includes or illustrates the paradigm shift. Is your concern that the value of human life will be degraded in a way that cannot be reversed, I asked? Or is it something more extreme, like some sort of nihilistic crisis of civilization because we've lost human worth? I don't mean to sound hyperbolic. Interesting. Life is miserable. It is often completely miserable. It is challenging. And what I see is an increasing atmosphere in which death is considered to be the solution to all major and serious suffering. Kant was the champion of autonomy. He is the one we have to thank for the idea of autonomy in our society. But he said, don't kill yourself. That would be putting all your autonomy to an end. Bohr was silent for a moment. I don't know that it can be proven, but what I do see is that the supply of euthanasia creates a certain demand. So those are two bits from different ends of the book and kind of show some of the progression and the issues um, I'm looking at. Um, so thank you for listening and I, I'll turn this over to, to Peggy and uh, Tim. I'm very grateful for to both of them for willing to chat with me today. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Uh, let me make sure that Tim and Peggy are unmuted and then um, okay. go ahead. Let me just start, Katie, by saying this is a wonderful book and it's wonderful reading, not only because you're such a good writer, but because the way of looking at this issue through um, stories about individual real people is so, um, so engaging, right? You walk with you. them through your portrait. You're very, I'm saying all this because I know not all of the audience has this book. And um, if they're looking for a good read, this is it. Uh, you have a very deft way of describing people with just a touch of, you know, um, this one has a, a gray beard, that one has a touch of red in the hair, this one has, you know. Uh, but it's really the human stories that work here. And of course, you've chosen them to illustrate several different kinds of problems. How you found all these people, I don't know, maybe you can say. But I'll start with that as a, an account of the book, which is, I think, and I've read an awful lot of stuff in this field. I think this book is terrific. It's also quite neutral about the issue. That's the other thing. It's not an advocacy book. It's not a, you know, defeatist, um, um, you know, denouncing book. It's a good book. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, echo that uh, comment to some degree. Um, I think anybody who thinks uh, that the decision 
to enact some kind of assisted dying as a simple decision uh, should read this book. And and I and it doesn't it clearly doesn't mean that one can't enact this at times, but but it ain't simple. And and the cases are all complex as are any real case. I mean that's that's that that's the rub of this whole process is that when you when you try to boil it down into something that's black and white and clear and easy, uh, then uh, then it then it's not real life, uh, and and your cases were were uh, quite striking in the sense that that a lot of people are thinking about these issues a lot, uh, and and yet there's a big difference between thinking about it and activating it and taking it up in earnest and then and then carrying it out and and how does one figure that out uh should one uh have medical people involved should it be extra medical you know should we take doctors out of the equation there's a lot of questions that this raises um uh that that i think anybody on either side of this debate uh, you know whether you whether you believe it should be an option. I'm I'm sort of one of those people who, who believes it should be an option of last resort. Uh, but even if you're a, a total opponent, uh, it's really worth kind of considering some of the issues raised in this. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Do you think we could talk about some of the specific cases that you um, uh, that you're uh, dealing with? Uh, the most, the last one the, from the uh, account of Nitschke uh, is about slippery slope issues and whether those are genuine or not. Do we have to worry about increasing reliance on assisted dying? Um, will there be social pressures for this the way we are? I think it's fair to say socially expected to euthanize our pets when they come close to the end. And mm -hmm. uh, as as you remark, uh, one of these figures says, "Well, if I didn't do that for my dog, right, I'd be accused of cruelty and you know inhumaneness and so on." Mm -hmm. So there's the question about social expectations, and we could talk about that first, or we could talk about the other um, uh, the issues that arise in the first selection we read. Whatever you like. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think with um, Dr. Nitschke was an interesting person to follow. I met him in 2015 and I continued speaking with him basically up to the final moment that this book was published and, you know, we're, we're still in touch. So it's been a lot of years now. And um, as a reporter, I got very lucky in that um, uh, not only is he just an interesting, thoughtful and terribly open person, but he went through his own sort of shift in thinking over the course of those five years, um, which I was able to, to write about. So Dr. Nitschke is an interesting figure because he um, he actually was the first doctor in, the, in Australia to perform legal physician-assisted death. Um, briefly, the country legalized um, aid in dying in, in the Northern Territory uh, for a brief period in the 90s. And, and Nitschke was really the doctor who was performing the, the procedure there. There weren't that many doctors in the area. Um, he became kind of famous in the country, at least, for developing a machine hooked up to a laptop that would let patients answer questions and have the drug injected themselves. Um, and Nitschke was, at the time, sort of a believer in the medical model that he was a, a, a good person to be evaluating patients and judging whether they met the criteria. When Australia rescinded the law in the Northern Territory, he had a kind of break um, and, and, and lost faith in a way with some of his colleagues, and he felt like he needed to continue the work. And I think sort of love him or loathe him, Nitschke really changed uh, the game when it comes to people having the ability and the information to organize on their own. So Nitschke started offering um, what he calls DIY death seminars. These are in-person seminars. I've attended a few of them in different countries. 
most attendees have white hair and are carrying notebooks and are scribbling frantically. Um, uh, at the beginning, he outlines his philosophy on aid and dying. And the second part of the, the seminar is really nitty gritty of cyanide does this and feels like this and, and you can get it here. Um, and he, he's moved all of those efforts online. Um, so in the case of Avril Henry, the first woman I read about, she had purchased his online suicide manual and learned a lot of things that way. Um, but over the course of, of my time with him, uh, Philip really moved away from thinking he should be the gatekeeper for this information. When we first met, he was, he still had kind of a loose criteria for who he thought should be able to access his information. And it wasn't certainly as tight as an organ style law, but he thought someone should be over, over 50 because then they'd be you know, reasonably sensible and, and able to make decisions about their lives. And he thought they should have something to qualify them. It didn't, you know, he wasn't really that picky about what it was, but some sort of cancer or heart condition, or maybe like a really bad rheumatoid arthritis, something that, you know, he felt made sense medically. And by the end, I know he was selling his manual to people who um, were worried about climate change and nuclear war and wanted to have drugs available in case of some sort of apocalypse. He was giving it to people who admitted to being depressed. He sort of accidentally um, sold the manual, although later stood by the decision to someone who um, was about to, to go on trial for um, allegedly murdering his wife. And Philip thought his decision was quite rational. Why not, why not end your life instead of rotting in jail? Um, so this is kind of the what I followed at the end of the book, and and I think it offered an interesting counterbalance to earlier parts of the book, which really did uh, spend a lot of time with doctors in the United States and elsewhere, who, of course, are carrying out the laws as they're written now um, with the strictly medical criteria. Uh, a dilemma that you could, and and I think you even talk about this in the book, you could separate out the assessment of somebody who's thinking about this and have a good palliative care type uh, person do that assessment uh, and then uh, have a separate person might be the prescriber or the you know the deliverer of the medicine and euthanasia uh, that wouldn't be the the caregiving person who's providing continuity of care uh, so and and you could you could do it completely separate you could the assessment could be an option rather than a requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I think having people who have experience in caring for really sick people in the cases you came up with are great examples of why you need people who are used to caring for really sick people because they were really complex. Uh, none none of them were really clear cut dying anyway. You know. <laughs> at death's door suffering in a in a physical way at high levels they were they were their suffering was suffering in the broadest sense of that word and and that requires a broad assessment uh, so maybe separating out the assessment and the suffering evaluation and treatment from the deliverer of the of the goods or the bads depending on your point of view yeah would be a good yeah. thing to do yeah, well, certainly, I think a lot of people, you know, doctors especially have proposed that as a model. And, and you know, even in, in a state like California, of course, doctors aren't always present at the at the deathbed. I think they more commonly are not. Um, but of course, they are involved in that assessment, the prescription writing. And, um, you know, proponents of that model will say, well, this is really important because we need to make sure that people aren't doing this because of bad care or inadequate care or because they're somehow not well connected to the healthcare system. This would be a way of um, really giving doctors opportunity to go through a patient's medical record and say, well, wait, this hasn't been tried or this doesn't look like it was done correctly. Um, and then critics of that model will you know, point to data from Oregon. So Oregon has um, had legal medical aid in dying for you know, more than two decades. They collect a fair amount of data um, we should be a little bit skeptical of the data, which we could talk about later. But, you know, that data suggests that the majority of people who are choosing aid and dying are not doing so because they're in pain um, or or because they are, you know, really, really fear end of life pain. It's more for 
existential reasons. They want to preserve what they would call their dignity, autonomy. They worry about losing the ability to do things they love. And I think it's fair to say, do things like human dignity and autonomy really fit well with like a medical style assessment? Is it doctors who should be doing this at all? Um, so I think that's very complicated. And then of course we have to, you know, recognize that all sorts of medical decisions are made in, in an imperfect healthcare environment. You know, someone can decide to stop chemotherapy um, and to, 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 you know, move to palliative or hospice care when, um, when they've maybe got inadequate oncology, oncological care so far. Um, it's very complicated. I had a very interesting conversation in Belgium. I met there with a doctor named Vim Distelmans, who's really, I mean, it's very strange to, to, to say in the American context, but he's really famous in Belgium for doing euthanasia. He's like a household name and he wins these philosophical awards, which are apparently very important in, in Belgium. And he's a big proponent. He's involved with an awful lot of cases, um, either as a prescribing physician or attending physician. And I was speaking to him in his office, and at some point halfway through, I brought up aid and dying in, in the United States context, and he physically recoiled from me. And he said, absolutely, this should not be legal in the United States. It's it's morally wrong to offer someone a right to die without first offering them a right to health care. Um, so, of course, that that does make things especially unique in the American context. So I think it's the evidence, at least from Oregon and elsewhere, is that people who don't have access to health care, um, that is people who are uninsured or people who are members of um, um, minority groups, people who are disabled, people with um, um, psychi psychiatric illness, people in all the vulnerable groups that we uh, are often encouraged to worry about. They are not the people who are getting aid in dying. Um, and yeah. so I think uh, Vim Distelman's concern is genuine, but it looks as though people in positions of less lesser privilege are not getting access to this if they want it. Yeah. I don't know whether they want it and are going without or are uninformed and hence going without or dying but deaths that are better somehow or other i don't believe that yeah. that's the case so i mean here's an issue of social justice that really needs further exploration yeah well i think yeah. i think that's right i think you know we aren't seeing those vulnerable groups i think there's a question of like the kind of health care people get earlier before they qualify for hospice and why they end up on hospice anyway but sure um when the when the oregon law was passed people thought that you know, there was some quote in the New York Times I read, they worried about, like, they said old people being lined up at the Oregon border in vans, you know, and and, and people had all sorts of worries that, you know, members of, of minority groups would be pressured into this. That definitely hasn't happened. On the other hand, we see people sometimes wanting access to aid and dying and not being able to, to, to find it. I spoke with an oncologist in a rural part of Oregon, and she told me about patients who kind of went through the process to qualify but then couldn't afford, they were, were, you know, couldn't afford $500 for the drugs. And she said, probably if they could have, couldn't have afforded the gas money to get to the pharmacy. And she had just had one of those patients say to her, you know, I guess I'll shoot myself in the head. And she had nothing to, to really offer him. Minority groups, you know, disproportionately unlikely to access aid in dying. And, and that's true of all sorts of palliative care. Um, I suspect that will be a, a bigger issue of, of conversation in the, the years to come. Uh, I've noticed in the last year, there's been a lot of attention to the issue of differences in maternal mortality rates between African-Americans and others. And I suspect we'll start to, to think about access to, to good quality palliative and hospice care too. Right. You know, there are also many choices available even in states where medical aid and dying is illegal to help people to die. So, so there are other what, what I've called last resort options, you know, palliative sedation, stopping eating and drinking, uh, going off of life supports, uh, you know, aggressive symptom management, all those things are, are done in the US healthcare system all the time 
uh, as part of palliative care, treating people at the very end of life. So all those uh, practices have the same risks as medical aid and dying, although although maybe to you know to go off a of life support, you have to be on a life support. So that does narrow the field. Uh, but still, uh, those would be the most expensive patients, the patients on life support. So really, we ought may, may, you know those arguments would say that, well, maybe we should take nobody off a of life support ever until we make sure everybody has access to all medical care. I mean, that would be ludicrous, right? Yeah. Yeah. So some of these arguments don't hold up when they're really pushed a little bit. Yeah. And I have to really thank Tim for fielding, I think, probably a fair amount of phone calls asking nitty gritty questions about palliative sedation. Um, but, you know, I think people are in a lot of ways, um, you know, the right the right to die is still, you know, we still act as if it's a debate completely separate from everything we know and understand about healthcare. And of course, really, it, it would be easier to consider it as part of a spectrum. You know, doctors can already legally do things that hasten death not necessarily by months, but certainly by hours or days. And I think there's really a misunderstanding of what that involves. I think there's even a misunderstanding when family members go through it. I can't tell you how many people I spoke to who tell me about deaths that just, you know, above all were profoundly confusing. Doctor or nurse said something and all of a sudden there were drugs and they weren't sure if anything came of the drugs and did that speed things along and it happened so quickly. And afterwards, no one really as an understanding of what happened and maybe there are lingering feelings of guilt or unease. Um, so I think, uh, you know, definitely people are fairly uneducated about um, the options that are already available. And that's built into, of course, the American healthcare system. If we think about the famous death panels debate of a few years ago, <laughs> you know, a lot of people remember vaguely Sarah Palin was around and she said something about death panels and there was a big uproar what she was fighting was the ability of doctors to be reimbursed for having conversations with patients at the end of their lives. Um, doctors weren't being reimbursed and the conversations weren't happening. So really this is kind of a institutionalized issue. And in in our, in our system tends to reinforce, particularly as you get down to some of these nitty gritty issues, to, to make them more hazy than they should be. It, and in point of fact, it should be a time for people being as honest and direct in both directions as possible about from patients and families, what do they really want and looking for? And for clinicians, what are they willing to provide and why are they or why are they not within the options that are available? Yeah, well, I guess, Tim, I'd have a question for you is, you know, patients talk to me about wanting to feel, you know, empowered at the end of their lives and aid in dying in some cases makes them feel empowered to make decisions. If you're talking to a patient who you know is heading into kind of a final stretch, are you talking about palliative sedation and what it is and life support and withdrawing and all of these things? Are you kind of giving them that information and asking what they want or does it tend to be an 11th hour sort of bedside decision or non-decision that gets made? I would say it varies between individuals, but if you have any acuity and openness People are hesitant to bring these things up, of course, because they might be perceived to be suicidal and get into trouble in that regard. So if you're open to the clues, and, and you can ask them, would you like to know what kind of options there are? So start open-ended, no, I don't wanna know about that stuff. Okay, well, if you ever wanna know, let me know and we can talk about it. So you, you open the door to the conversation, but not forcing it on everybody. Because for some people, uh, particularly, those who haven't had access to good health care, in point of fact, these conversations are frightening uh, yeah, because yeah. people may be too inclined to let go too easily or quickly, uh, yeah. as opposed to not quickly enough. One of the, the shocking stats that I have on hand from my book is I interviewed the head of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Association, and I was asking about palliative sedation, and I was asking about the more extreme sort of sedation to unconsciousness. And I was saying, how often does palliative sedation happen? And his organization estimated, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, it happens in between one and 52% of deaths in the United States, which I right. thought, you know, is obviously comedic in its imprecision and, um, and really kind of shocking in a way, because it means that patients have no idea, to, you know, whether this is something they can expect to be an option or, or, or not. 
Well, the, the, the problem with that piece of data is that, uh, or the enlightenment of that piece of data is that th those variations depend on the values of clinicians, not on patients and families. And that should be shocking to people mm -hmm. and frightening because, because what you really want is to have everybody who's interested be given the information they need and be the as much as possible have the choice in their hands yeah, and this suggests yes. that it's a lot more in clinicians hands that, and then it's in patients hands yeah my naivety was very useful as i was supporting this book i remember speaking to a doctor in california who said to me yeah i don't i don't ask for consent before i sedate my pa do palliative sedation i don't think it's something i need to ask for consent for it's just good care and i was really struck by that and i know he's not you know, an aberration that, that plenty of doctors see it the same way. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think people would probably be shocked by that if they if they knew it, maybe when they read it. <laughs> now, some of that sedation comes from people who are in extremes of physical suffering. And I think I think in those circumstances of patients and family, you got to do something and, mm -hmm. and they're eager. They don't need a lot of information. They just need you to do something. But in the more subtle cases, then there's a lot more nuance and those that that's really needs to be a mutual back and forth conversation for sure. And of course, yeah. the conversation should start a little earlier. That is before those extremes come to be the case. You as the clinician can presumably see that that's a likely um, further um, step in the, in the final course of a disease. Uh, and that ideally you'd like want decision making about when and if to be made way ahead of time. After all, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know data about this, but my hunch is that many, many people who are, who have ever thought about their own dying at all have a background um, sense of the way they would uh, rather have things go. That I, I thought some time ago I went around talking very informally to people, just random people, you know, this is better than, you know, with less restraint than you've operated with, Katie. But asking people about um, how they, you know, if you could ask them a really personal question and how they would um, want their own deaths to go. And about half of them said, this is in no way a, you know, a careful sample. Well, I just like to go to sleep and never wake up. And the other half said things like, oh, well, how would I like my death to go? This was a woman in Southern California. I'd like it to be at the beach, facing west towards the sunset. And I'd like to have my family there, all except for so-and-so. And she was very particular about <laughs> so-and-so's not being there. Uh, and I'd like to have this music playing. So seems to me that deathbed tableau is a feature of the thinking of lots of people and the i just like to go to sleep and not know anything about it never wake up is the thinking of lots of other people and how we can decide design policies that accom accommodate both of those basic attitudes towards one's own death I, I don't know but i think we need to do some thinking at that level also and yeah, uh, yeah, and that's that's talking to people long before serious illness comes to be the case. How can we tap those things? Yeah, well, I think you know um, certainly uh, when laws passed in places like Oregon, doctors thought that patients were going to be marching into their offices with you know I I have six months left to live and I want this right now, and that hasn't been the case. And most people who are choosing aid and dying or doing so when really they have weeks, often days left. Um, but I think you're right. I wonder as this becomes more common in, in certain places, whether you might find more people focused on the kind of ritual or, or aesthetics of, of, of their death. Um, and I know Dr. Shavelson, who I, again, I think is listening, you know, he, um, he told me all sorts of stories about patients who did you know, they weren't doing this with six months left to go on the beach, but who certainly used family tradition and ritual um, in interesting ways and in a way were able to give themselves the kind of romantic deathbed scene that 
we read about or see in movies where actually there could be carefully offered final words and gestures um, in a way that just might not be possible when when you don't know when that final moment is. So, um, so I do wonder if that's something people will move towards. It's definitely something that Dr. Nitschke's interested in. Um, uh, he he's sort of obsessed with soil and green and the idea of like a really aesthetic death being something that people plan for. Maybe there's equivalence to to the birth process where I think we see a lot more women really thinking about the kind of birth they want, where they want it to be, and in some cases moving away from from a medical model, rightly or wrongly, um, to to get what they want. So there's a there's a two prong question that that you can ask people who are going in, into this, and and they open up very different vistas of of understanding. One is what, given the fact that you're seriously ill or at a certain stage in life, what are you most hoping for? And and then you can try to help them set up things to help them achieve things that they're hoping for. Often, family issues or those kinds of things. And then the the opposite side of that question is, what are you most afraid of? And that usually leads to conversations about what deaths have been like that they've witnessed in their family or, or their people they care about, and wondering, geez, if that happens, what are my options? What can I do? What choices will I have? And having those conversations early on is hugely helpful because you can, first of all, with your clinician or whoever's going to be, or your family, your clinician, what are going to be the options in both of those domains? Yeah, and how yeah. can I try to maximize the good stuff and minimize the possibility that I'm going to get into the harsh stuff? And if I get into the hard stuff, people yeah. will be with me and help me figure out a way out. Is it mostly pain that you find patients fear most when you ask that question? Uh, pain is part of it. Uh, uh, for some people, it's being dependent. Uh, some people, it's being alone. Uh, some people, it's uh, uh, being too uh, out of control, those kinds of things. So it's, it's a big range of, of things. It, it, you know, pain, and pain is, of course, is in medicine, it's probably our best case scenario. Yes. And so when yeah. people say they're most afraid of pain, you know, I'm I get excited, you know, because I know, pain. <laughs> and I got answers yeah. for that that are reasonably good. I mean, they, they're yeah. not always perfect, but at, at, if push comes to shove, if pain is the issue, I can give them the kitchen sink uh, in terms of pain medicine, and they will be out of pain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But other things are a little more tricky, you know, out of control, you know, weak, dependent, yeah. those kinds of things. You know, there's no simple reassurance for those. Yeah. I did find it hard to kind of evaluate what is driving aid and dying decisions, you know, what people most are afraid of. Um, the reason I said I was slightly skeptical of the Oregon data, same with the California data, same with, with anywhere else, is that um, we don't have accounts from patients themselves. So when people in Oregon talk about, well, what people fear most is loss of dignity and then it's loss of autonomy, it's not pain. Well, that's from surveys filled out by physicians, uh, sometimes after the fact, sometimes weeks after a death, um, sometimes by a physician who, who doesn't know the patient particularly well or hasn't known the patient for a long time. And I do sort of wonder, you know, how willing are doctors to admit, yes, my patient feared being in pain. Yes, my patient was in pain. And, and that's why they did this. You know, that seems like something a doctor would, would resist noticing. Likewise, you know, um, we see in Oregon, you know, basically no patient worries about money as a, as a factor. Um, this doesn't motivate them at all. Well, when was the last time anyone had a conversation with their doctor about you know, financial precarity, I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's relatively rare. So, um, you know, lawmakers write the laws this way so that patients aren't overly burdened with paperwork and, you know, privacy is uh, maintained and all of that. But I do think, you know, there are researchers who sort of mourn this data that doesn't exist. It would be quite interesting to have more accounts from, from patients. And I've wondered whether, there might be room for state initiatives kind of away from the law that ask patients to to offer some information in a non-mandatory way. There is a body of um, interviews with patients um, uh, that was accumulated some time ago. I think it's at the University of Washington, Yeah. but one could hunt that up. And certainly it sh more of it should be put together. You're absolutely right about that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Linda Ganzini has done a number of studies looking at what people are most afraid of, and and uh, and it and it turns out that pain is not the biggest thing. You know, it it really is dependency and and uh, aloneness, those kinds of things being mm -hmm. out of control. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing about advanced conversations, that is conversations with your physician well in advance, um, is that that gives the patient more um, leeway to change doctors. If your doctor says, I don't do that, or I'm not willing to think about that, or practice in, a, in an institution that won't permit that, uh, that might be the cue to look around somewhere else. Yes. Um, but that has to happen way in advance. Yeah. yeah. It can't be the last minute. I certainly found there were patients who end up on hospice care. Their hospice is resistant to mm -hmm. something like aid and dying. Um, by the time they find out they're sick and maybe they know their doctor, I think there's a, there's a lot of patchy hospice care, but they're they're in that system. I certainly met people who weren't aware that they were in the ca a Catholic healthcare oh setting. God. So my book begins with a man named Bradshaw Perkins Jr. And he did end up um, getting an assisted death, but uh, first he asked several nurses at his hospice about it and they'd shut down the conversation and, and probably in a way made him feel ashamed such that he didn't bring it up um, with his children for, for some time. Um, and that's Betis Hospice, the largest for-profit hospice chain in the United States, which happens to be Catholic, but doesn't necessarily sound that way to everyone. <laughs> you know, there are lots of people who, you know, their, their local hospital used to be Saint this or that. And now it's changed to Dignity Healthcare Incorporated. And, and again, it's a Catholic healthcare system with those values and they're not aware of it. So I, I think that's um, certainly a problem. In Canada, one of the interesting things is, like in the United States, doctors, they don't have to offer aid in dying, but they do have to make what, um, what is called an effective referral to someone who does. So in the United States, they don't need to refer at all. In Canada, they have to make a referral, and it really has to be like a real referral to someone and, and a proper handover of care. So I think that prevents situations where... A, a physician's personal beliefs really prevents access. So I, I'm, I'm going to propose that we shift gears and talk about two of your other cases, which are different situations. One, one is uh, this, the uh, losing memory. So mm -hmm. people with impending uh, dementia and then people with psychiatric illness, your patient with OCD. So maybe we could start with the one who's, maybe you could just briefly Tell us something about the one of losing memory and, sure. and how how that went down, and and we can massage that a little bit to see because that that's a huge ep epidemiologically huge issue, right? Yeah, yeah. That so be one of my fears as well. So yeah. Me. Well, I think a lot of people fear dementia more than death. Um, I was very lucky to meet a woman named Deborah Kusid, who lived. Um, on the coast in Oregon, and I spent time with her and, and was in conversation with her really over, I think it was a three-month stretch um, before her, her death. Um, and Deborah had been diagnosed with dementia. It was still at a fairly mild stage, although she felt um, that she was progressing quite quickly in ways that doctors weren't able to adequately measure. And she really feared above all losing control of, of herself and, and ending up in an institution where, as she described it, she was, you know, sort of cared for, but unloved. Um, she'd had a history of uh, child sexual abuse, which also made her particularly fearful of ending up in a state where she couldn't advocate for herself. Um, and so I really followed Deborah over, over those few months as she made plans to end her life, um, which she did. Um, and, you know, we got into all sorts of things. Yes, dementia was guiding her, but also things like money. Um, she worried about losing her home. Um, she worried about being able to, you know, afford the pain medication she needed. Um, and Deborah ended up getting help from a group called the Final Exit Network, which is one of the really organized 
I, 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 I draw the parallel with the Jane Collective and, and abortion access, but that's really one of these on the ground groups in the US offering education. I would say offering assistance. I can see already from the attendance list that there's some members of the group here and they hate, you know, the, the word assistance is what leaves them legally liable. So they would say they aren't assisting, they're providing education. They teach people how to end their lives um, using legally uh, materials that can be legally obtained. And they, in some cases, are, are present at the, those deaths. So. Um, Deborah, let me explore the issue of dementia. There are a couple places in the world that do allow aid in dying for dementia. Um, it's always sort of imperfect in execution. Um, and in Belgium, a patient in an early stage like Deborah can make the decision to uh, end her life. Um, the hunch is that the, the hitch is that she needs to be mentally competent at the time of her death, which means that she must die relatively early when she's in an early stage, which means that she's losing out on good months and maybe even years for fear of losing the opportunity. In the Netherlands, a patient can write an advanced directive saying, you know, at this stage when I no longer recognize my husband or I can't eat or I can't um, speak, I wish to receive euthanasia. Um, and that's you know very legal in the country, but it's very rare because doctors don't like to do it. It means practically in some cases euthanizing someone who seems to be happy um, and content. And in some cases, doctors you know make promises to patients that they don't keep. Um, so the issue of dementia is certainly very complicated. In Canada, the government um, was considering allowing an advanced directive provision for dementia, but decided not to. Um, the other person you asked me to talk about was um, a man named Adam Meyer Clayton, who was in his mid 20s when I met him in Canada. And um, we met at the time that Canada had, you know, was passing its federal aid and dying law. And Adam was advocating for the law to include people like him who had um, serious mental illness a history of serious mental illness and um, he had kind of a collection of things anxiety depression and at times quite debilitating obsessive compulsive disorder and I spent time on and off speaking with Adam and his family and his friends and his doctors and his therapists um, until he he ended up taking his life on his own after Canada decided not to extend the law to people with mental illness and again, this is a complicated story where, yes, I was examining the issue of aid and dying for people with with mental illness, but also looking at access to care, um, you know, which wasn't always great for Adam and looking at the issue of which comes up in physical illness, but the issue of how much we require patients to try before offering them death, you know, in the case of a mental illness, how many how many courses of treatment, how many types of therapy would you demand that someone um, attempt before an assisted death is available. Um, so those are those are two important chapters in the book, I think. Um, and in fact, Canada, you know, a few years after Adam died, Canada has has decided to expand its law. And in 2023, people with mental illness who don't have a, a physical illness will qualify. And I think that will end up being very complicated and um, and very heated here. Thank you, Katie. Um, we have many great questions coming in from our audience today. Um, so I'd like to start with a question from our very own Delano Kopru, who moderated the lunch hour last week with Lonnie Javelson. Um, he says, Katie, a great line that emerges from your upcoming, from your current book is, uh, death is not poetry. Um, and Dr. Shavelson agrees with you. Um, in your view, why does the trope of romantic death persist? Um, I think it's, you know, the, the deaths that we read about and see about on television tend to, to be more kind of, they tend to be more poetic, by which I think I mean they tend to involve some kind of closure, whether that's final words or some sort of resolution, um, some sort of, uh, you know, slowing down and leading to a, a closure that feels complete. And I just don't think that ends up existing for a lot of people. As I said before, I think a lot of deaths in the United States are um, confusing 
Uh, they're often the product of decisions not made at different times. So when moving almost passively from thing treatment to treatment to drug to drug, and all of a sudden it's the end. Um, I think deaths more you know occur in hospital settings much more often than people imagine when they're thinking about how they would like to die, whether that's good or not. But certainly, I think the romantic idea endures. And actually, Peggy, I was thinking, you know, when you said, when you talked about your informal poll and 50% wanted this and 50% wanted that, I was surprised that 90% didn't say, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. Um, and I think that kind of leads to, to some of um, this disappointment, really. I think that people I met experienced after the death of a loved one. And I think we ought to be also more alert to our cultural and religious antecedents. So that deathbed picture, that's Old Testament. You can find that in stories of patriarchs conveying their blessings to their, you know, um, descendants and so on. That's a picture that is present in lots of religious conceptions, or at least religious um, historical pictures. And um, I think it has a lot of power, right? That's the, and the, and, but you're of course right that deaths in a modern medical setting don't look like that or may not look like that at all. You just see clusters of people around a ICU bed or something where death is expected, but somehow it's a, I guess it's a different environment among other things, but that, that picture is pretty deeply rooted in some ways, right? Just to put out there, there there are even in the modern era some absolutely beautiful deaths, uh, where people are making a decision, families come together, everybody says goodbye. It, it it's probably in the usual setting uh, would be stopping a life support, mm -hmm. because and that's very similar to euthanasia or an assisted dying because there's a moment that people unify around and a goodbye and and. A, an opportunity for reconciliation. Now, a lot of times it's not like that. You know, maybe even the majority it's not. So, so if the wheels are falling off, there's a tremendous relief when death comes because, because when the wheels are falling off, that's disintegration of the person and the self. And that is a, that's, a, that's an unnerving, completely unsettling experience. So there's a relief then, but that's not, that's not a beautiful death. That's just a, a, a notion that death is not always the enemy for sure. Mm -hmm. So our, our audience member, Judith, um, is wondering, Katie, apart from being quote unquote empowered, have you talked ever to anyone who has considered they were making a quote unquote pragmatic decision, for lack of a better word? Yeah, I think um, pragmatism does come into it. I mean, if I think about the woman I just described who had dementia and, um, you know, wanted to avoid uh, falling further into the to the disease. Um, yes, dementia was the primary motivating factor. I would say a very close second would be financial matters. Um, she, her husband had passed away. Um, I think this is sort of typical in, in some sorts of marriages. She'd re she really had no idea what dire financial straits she was in until her husband died and she all of a sudden was was left with the, the financial records. Um, she was getting letters warning of foreclosure on her home. She worried about losing her home um, and having to move and um, having to relocate at a time where she didn't feel kind of mentally or physically able to do so. Um, and also she really wanted to preserve her savings she didn't have a lot of money, but it was very, very important to her that the money she have go to the Humane Society. Her great passion in life was, you know, with the dogs that she had and she, they were rescue dogs and she wanted to help other dogs. And for her sense of legacy, she needed to feel like she was leaving money to animals um, to help them. And it, I think would have broken her heart to, to imagine her estate dwindling down to nothing um, for nursing home fees before she could qualify for, for Medicaid and, and live out her days on, on state assistance. So I think those were, you know, practical decisions. Um, uh, she also had a certain limited number of uh, pain pills left and didn't want to outlive those. So um, certainly I think there's all sorts of 
you know, things coming in like that and, 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 and legacy and money, one of them. Thank you. Um, Holly is wondering whether there are any states, um, whether there are any states that have tried to broaden the law that goes beyond the six months left to live, like those dying of ALS or Alzheimer's. Yeah, so I know in Oregon, there have been a few initiatives. Um, and if I spoke with this uh, legislator named Mitt Greenlick, um, he had proposed an expansion to the law that would maybe exp expand the six months requirement, certainly, and maybe open it up to people who have things like dementia. He was motivated by the suicide of a lobbyist he knew who um, ended up shooting himself because he had dementia. And that really struck this legislator. He thought there, there should have been a better way for him to go. Um, but those efforts have all failed. Um, I I know that they've also, my understanding is that they've also been resisted by the large right to die organizations in the United States, the kind of normal lobby groups that are pushing laws. Um, and I think that in some ways is a, I think it's a, in some ways a political decision. You know, maybe there are people who are part of the organization who would really, who really think six months is just the perfect time frame. but I think others worry about what an expanded law in Oregon would do to campaigns in other states. You know, if the law expands in Oregon, it does let someone in, you know, New York State say, well, look, the slippery slope is real. The law does inevitably expand just like people warned us that it would. Um, so I think certainly in the American context, they're keeping those laws narrow. I will say in other in the other countries where aid and dying is legal, the laws have expanded um, over time, um, both formally, like the, the laws will legally be expanded to include new categories of patients, but also sort of informally, where I think doctors, you know, will sort of offer aid and dying to someone who feels like, you know, it's sort of on the border, and then that becomes a, a, a more normal situation. So there's a question you raise in your book, Katie, uh, this is right at the end about whether whether the very low frequency of use of aid and dying, which is the case in this country, it's something like four tenths of one percent of people yeah. who die, uh, that's the figure from Oregon, or even four percent of people who die in the Netherlands, whether there's something magical about that level, what if it were to become a more usual and normal way for um, people to choose to die? Should we think of that as a slippery slope towards a bad end or as a slippery sl slope towards a better world in which people have more choice? And to try to yeah. discuss the global incidence is, I, I think, something that for your next book. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely in, in every, in, in most states, you know, it will be, ex it's extremely rare when the law passes and then it becomes a little bit more common, but you're right, it has stayed relatively rare. Um, I think it's hard to know whether that's because the requirements are just so strict and narrow in the United States that um, it just makes it quite hard. I certainly found that, you know, a lot of people had to fight for, for to, to get an assisted death, um, and they had to have both the financial and kind of cultural, social resources to advocate for themselves and confusing medical systems. Um, uh, so that that could be limiting things, but but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I do know in the Netherlands, you know, it's four percent of deaths now, and it's that's that's grown over time, and it's meant that euthanasia, and it is usually physician administered there, um, has lost that kind of specialness. Really, everyone knows someone who's who's chosen this and knows that it's an option. Yeah. Well, there. I, I hope, Sarah, that uh, we could permit this. There are a couple of people listening in. Lonnie, Dr. Shavelson is one of them, and Dr. David Grube of uh, Compassion and Choices is another one, and probably some other folks out there. I'd be interested to hear from them about the responses, their responses to your book. If yeah, we, if we have I would love to. They're both. Um, they're both. They both make appearances. Um, uh huh. That's right. Right. I know this has to be quick. <laughs> I just 
I just uh, promoted David group. So David, uh, if you're there, uh, feel free to unmute and I will uh, find Lonnie and promote him as well. Lonnie is the, is the opening chapter of <laughs> this book. I'm afraid Lonnie got more than he bargained for because, you know, he is one, he is the, the star of one chapter, but it's really the chapter that everyone's wanted to talk about um, so far. Um, so both uh, Lonnie and David, you're promoted. So if you can jump in, um, feel free to. Uh, otherwise, we have um, several other questions from the audience. Um, so I'll, I'll just turn to those until David and Lonnie are ready. Um, so for, this is a question from B. Missler. Um, for all three of you, can you share more of your thoughts about the key factors or assessment techniques uh, for training new clinicians in separating depressed and suicidal patients who clinicians should try to keep alive from those who are talking about it um, late and dying today? Tim might have a better sense of this um, as a clinician, which I'm not, but, um, you know, uh, uh, in a lot of ways, I think the way we talk about, you know, mental illness is this category over here and physical illness is this category over here is a little bit artificial. Um, you know, mental illness is quite prevalent. A lot of people who qualify for aid in dying on the basis of cancer, say, um, have histories of depression or anxiety or, or whatever it is. Um, and so uh, mental illness ends up being part of the equation. Um, but, you know, physicians are, are there to assess capacity. Um, capacity is, as I learned while writing this book, um, specific to a moment and a choice. So someone doesn't have capacity or not have capacity in a holistic sense. They're capable or incapable of making a you know, this decision at this time. And, you know, patients who have histories of, of depression do end up qualifying because their physicians decide that, um, you know, they're quite competent to make those decisions. Just like people with mental illness make all sorts of decisions about all sorts of things in their lives. Um, in a small minority of cases, physicians will refer um, a requesting patient to a psychologist or psychiatrist for a psychiatric assessment. And those assessments, I think, you know, they can be complicated. A person has to, you know, I, I spoke to a psychiatrist and she described it as, you know, she has to de decide in, in this meeting whether depression exists alongside the physical condition or whether it's somehow influencing the, the way that the physical condition is being understood or experienced. Um, but I think to be turned down for after a psychiatric ass assessment is quite rare. Thank you, Katie. Um, Lonnie, I see you're connected with audio and video, so please go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. First, Katie, I mean, thanks, I think, and I wrote this to you personally that I think you've written probably the best overview book on this field that I've ever read. And I've read, like Peggy, we've read these things until they're coming out of our ears. Um, but I, I think you've really achieved something wonderful. And thanks for that. Um, you know, just just two thoughts, if I may, and mostly I wanted, I've been enjoying listening to this and shutting my mouth. Um, but I, I think there's this a little bit of a myth mythology, like there's an on or off switch, where people decide for medical aid and dying and then it happens or they don't. And, and I, I'm referring somewhat to Tim's idea where it, maybe it, it could be that that another um, group of physicians or, or clinicians um, makes the decision about whether it should be and then there's a separate prescribing doctor. But, but when, when I work with patients who are thinking about medical aid and dying, and I always use the term considering medical aid and dying, there, there's no switch off point where they say yes. What, what you have is a, a period as they approach death of flux. That's exactly as it should be. Yes, maybe I want this. Yes, maybe I don't. Yes, I will never be alone in bed and I can't get out of the bed myself. And that's when I'll want to die. And then they get into the bed themselves and they realize there's lots of life left and they delay or hesitate. And, and this ongoing conversation between the so-called prescriber, who by that time should really be tightly knowing the patient and providing advice. And, and it's not like this idea also of, of devoiding this from or divulging it or separating it from uh, clinical medicine as if as if 
what is the role of the doctor? Well, the role of the doctor is what the role of the doctor always is. We provide knowledge and advice. We don't tell people what to do, but 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 in making a decision, for example, about chemotherapy or whether you want aid in dying or not, or radiation therapy, or whether you want antibiotics or get off the ventilator, um, patients are, are are needing good clinical information. And, and to ever have that go away, I think would be tragic. Uh, death is still medicalized. Death still happens when we need palliative care and we need aid in dying care and we need psychiatric care and social worker care. And, and to move that into this, oh, it's become a social issue, I think would be a vast mistake as to the ability of clinicians to participate with their patients in the most caring, loving way we can, which is to sit down and say, what do you think about how your next week is going? And, and they often will tell you something that's entirely clinically not making sense. And you can say, oh, well, you know, actually here's how I, here's how I see it's going. There, there's no on off switch between medical aid and dying and yes or no. It's, it's a continuum of process along the road to death. And I think that we have to really acknowledge it as that complex and not black and white. And I think that's something you did very well in your book. But I, but I often hear this thing of, you know, oh, the doctor can be an uninvolved once he writes the prescription. That's garbage. Uh, the death isn't dead. The patient is not dead until they are dead. And the method of their death is not known until the moment their heart stops. And, and it's all up in the air until that point in time. So, mm -hmm. so for what that's worth, that's kind of a, a thing I wanted to, to bring out. Very Thank good point. you so much for jumping in, Lonnie. Go ahead. I know Lonnie, Lonnie introduced me to a hospice doctor in California named Gary Pasternak, and he gave me this little anecdote that kind of speaks to that, that I was really struck by. And he said he had this patient who, you know, she said she wanted aid in dying and she qualified for it. And, you know, yes, she got the approvals. And, um, you know, she was living in a kind of inpatient hospice house. So he saw her with some frequency and every day she would ask him, do you think I should do it today, doctor? Is today the day? And his question to her was always, is today a good enough day? Is today a good enough day? And if it was, okay, we'll talk tomorrow. And so it went for a few weeks and she ended up dying, you know, what we would call a natural death um, without choosing to do this at all because every day was a good enough day. So um, that definitely speaks to the idea of a continued conversation. And David Grub, I see you're connected. Um, would you like to say a few words? Muted. Um, David, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Um, you're unmuted, but the audio isn't connected. So, so try going into settings and, and double checking your audio. Um, and in the meantime, we'll circle back. Um, we, we had a question earlier from Paul Menzel. Um, he's wondering, um, Katie, in, the, in your book, you mentioned uh, the story of Maya Calloway. Um, and Paul says, she seems not to have considered seriously VSED or voluntarily stopping eating and drinking as a viable way to hasten her death. Um, it, you know, it would avoid the difficult travel to Switzerland, and it is legal in every U.S. state. Um, He's wondering, was she informed of how likely comfortable such a death can be if supported by good palliative care? Um, if not, why not? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, this is a woman I followed for a number of years who has multiple sclerosis. She's around 40 now. Um, like many people who are dying, she is very active on with Google research. So she's definitely aware of the option of visa. I think what's confusing to her, perhaps. What was certainly confusing to me is just the different um, the different ways that doctors talk about this. I mean, I had just as many doctors tell me this is this is painless, this is achievable. I do this, you know, I help patients with this, you know, regularly. Um, as I did doctors who said like this is basically impossible. It always fails. It's it's a pretty bad way to go, especially if you have any kind of physical strength. And Maya is still you know, um, able to walk with with assistance. Um, so I think that's something confusing. I think she also, um, I, she said something like, you know, she hates the idea of having to, as she says, starve herself to death. 
instead of just getting what she wants when she wants it. She hates the idea of it being a process rather than um, a kind of moment. So, um, but you're right, I do think um, I found it to be, I found Visa to be one of the more confusing things I, I tried to research just because of the variation in medical opinion. And I think there's not a lot of conversation about it yet. Although, although for, for the real controlling types, which is a lot of us and a lot of people who want these options, Visa it actually puts the control in their ballpark. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and they and they are they if they're if they're of that mindset, it may be a viable option, particularly if they live in a place where these other options are not available. Well, I'm very relieved to hear of a forthcoming book. I think that you co-author about this subject, which I hope will give give you some clarity at least. Thank you. Is David Grube able to talk yet? Let's see. Hi, David. I don't think his audio is connected, unfortunately. Um, but David, if you put your comment in the chat, uh, I'm happy to read it. Um, Tim and Peggy, remind us of the title of your forthcoming book that we're so eagerly anticipating. It's Tim, no, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's called Voluntarily Stopping Eating and Drinking. And it, it, it's something about, I, I, I'm, we, I'm not sure that we've totally settled on the final subtitle, but it's something about a, uh, an option, uh, uh, a viable option at the end of life, uh, something like that. Should be coming out by, by uh, early, late spring. Yeah, viable is wonderfully ironic. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and Wonderful. You Thank you, Tim. Who the other authors are. It's you and Paul Menzel and um, Judith Bad Schwartz Pope. and Thad Pope. It's a great cast of characters. And, and many Schwartz. others, and many others actually have participated. Okay, contributed stuff to it, but you're yeah. the ones who've done the Good. work. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we, we have time for a few more questions, uh, maybe just one that I see where we're almost uh, at 1.30 here, Eastern time. Um, so uh, this is from Sue Schrader. Um, she says, Katie, your book is a magnificent read. Thank you. Um, she does finish chapter five on the mind. Um, would you mind commenting on the irony of how capital punishment uh, kills severely mentally ill individuals? For example, Lisa M Montgomery while others afflicted with mental illness, such as Adam, must suffer with no legal option. Uh, what are your thoughts? Ooh, um, that's quite the question. Um, I do think I had people who who regularly asked me why the United States is one of, oh, David's here also, but um, one of the, you know, few, few places in the world that does perform <laughs> capital punishment, um, but doesn't let people have the choice um, to get a, a lethal injection. Um, but um, but I, I think that's an interesting point that I hadn't fully considered, of course, is when we're thinking about ending the life of someone who doesn't necessarily have full capacity or, or full understanding of their situation. Um, uh, I do know that, um, yeah, so I think that's an interesting point. Thank you. Um, and, and David, I'm still waiting for your comment in the, the chat um, since we still can't hear you, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, Edmund is wondering, um, in countries where euthanasia and aid in dying are allowed, why do people overwhelmingly prefer euthanasia rather than self-administration? Do people in those countries trust their doctors more than Americans do? Um, I, also a tricky I, question. I, I can't. I can't say whether that's a matter of, of trust. I will say, yes, in every other place where assist aid in dying is legal, euthanasia is also legal. So, so the, the patient has the option of a, receiving a lethal injection and almost all of the time they choose it. In fact, in um, a number of countries, if a patient does choose to self-administer, a doctor is required to be there with a lethal injection on hand as a backup in case something goes wrong, um, say with vomiting or, or and the, and the, the death is taking a long time. Um, I think people 
you know, part of the point of this is that people want to die peacefully and reliably and quickly, and that's um, achievable through an injection. I think doctors like Dr. Shavelson and Dr. Groove have been working to make the self-administration um, more streamlined and, and, and simpler and, and faster, but um, there's still more variation. Um, um, and in some cases, it's, it's um, difficult to administer the drug. For instance, if someone is um, unable to swallow in the case of ALS. Um, so I think, you know, in, in places where people choose a lethal injection, often, you know, the doctor's in there and kind of gives the injection, but then the doctor can really leave the bedside and step back and, okay. and let the family come in. There's also a level of validation that comes with clinician administered medication. So it, it, there, is, there are psychological layers to this that are quite important. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, we are um, at the end of our time today. Um, any, any last thoughts, Peggy or Tim, before we conclude? Oh, I'd love to Our keep page. going talking about this book for a long time. <laughs> There's so many interesting issues in here. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone buys it and <laughs> recommends it to their friends. Um, and uh, and my email address is on my website. <laughs> here it is, right? Yeah. That's exactly. the commercial. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, and you really, you really showed that there's nothing simple about this, and and that is the beauty of your stories. Really, they capture the real experience of people going through this. So, for anybody who's interested in these kinds of topics, it'd be a good read. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tim and Peggy, for joining Katie today in conversation. It's always a delight to to welcome you here. And Katie, thank you so much for being here today. For writing this incredible book that focuses so centrally on all of the issues that we at the Completed Life Initiative are um, so passionate about exploring. Um, and you have written an incredibly beautiful um, and you know neutral book, which um, it's just an incredible read and, and I just applaud you so much. Um, so, so thank you for, for being here today for for speaking um, and for um, for your book, which um, and everyone who's interested who hasn't been able to get a copy yet can do so um, on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, it's widely available on the internet as well. Um, it's called The Inevitable Dispatches on the Right to Die. Um, and thank you to Lonnie Shavelson and David Grub for popping up um, on a short minute's notice. Um, we appreciate you being here as well and thank you so much to our audience um, it's always wonderful to get your your questions and and for you attending today so thank you all again so much um, today has been a delight and an honor um, and uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to future completed life events um, in the near future so please stay tuned via our um, our mailing list and our website, uh, www.completedlife.org. Um, and if you happen to have been on social media throughout this, this incredible conversation today, please uh, tag us at Completed Life or hashtag Completed Life. Um, so thank you again. Be well, take care, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.